see that David has penned this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For if you were to read this, you would think that this has been written after the crucifixion. In hindsight of all that was witnessed and all that was seen and all that took place, that it was written after the event. But the reality is, as we all know full well, is that this is prophecy over a thousand years before the crucifixion ever happening of Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. And so we have to say, look at this and say, well, what is David talking about? What is his experience? What is happening to David at this time? Well, he's suffering. That's a very human experience. He's suffering. He's struggling. He, he's probably, we don't know specifically. We can't say a specific incident where this is drawn from, but we do know that David came under immense trial immense stress at different times in his life and also was immensely disobedient at different times of his life where at such points God could have left him. In a sense in Psalm 51 he talks doesn't he there, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me and we know that situation that he was under with uh, adultery that he had committed with Bathsheba and he was crying out to God to create in him put a new spirit and to forgive him of his sins and of course God would hear his prayer but it's a shared experience that he's that he's having it could have been when there was that coup that was taking place under Absalom he was meeting people at the city gates and turning all of Israel against his own father and they had to rise up with Absalom on David's side and the armies met and there was a great battle. David stayed back, didn't he, in Jerusalem. He didn't go into battle. But what a thing to have your own son turn against you, seeking your downfall, your own child. And then on the run under Saul, seeking his life. The Lord's anointed there. There he was as a young boy, wasn't he? Playing the harp in, in, in Saul's presence. Saul get, I think he was playing the harp, something like that. And Saul gets out a spear at one point and throws it at him. But misses him. So we, we can't be specific. It, it, it doesn't say. But we do know that this is his own felt experience because he's not just writing, he, David's not just sitting down thinking, oh the Lord's telling me to write about Jesus. He's writing about his own experience and his own situation and prophetically this prophet is speaking about a future uh, event also. But here we see a shared experience of suffering. Verses 1 to 2, he feels forsaken of God. Verse 2, he's crying out to God in prayer but his prayers are not being answered. They're not being heard. What's the point? Then in um, verses 6 to 8, he, he, he feels like he's a worm. I am a worm. A, a worm's a little insect, isn't it? It's an insignificant thing burrowing around in the ground. I am not a man, I'm a worm. Scorned by mankind, he says. Despised by the people. All who see me mock me and they make mouths at me and they wag their heads. And they're saying, you know, he trusts in the Lord. Well, let the Lord deliver him. So they're belittling him. And verses 12 to 18, he, many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me. Like ravening and roaring lion, I am poured out like water. He's, he's weak. His strength is dried up. Evil people encompass him. Dogs, he calls them. Evil doers encircle me. 
They have pierced my hands and my feet. Wow. So David's experience is, is one of suffering. But again, we see this spirit of prophecy taking up his experiences. So I just want to see some application to the Christian and suffering. A sense of forsakenness of God. And, and the Christian can experience that, for David experiences it. It's not an anomaly. It's not that you should be dancing around and be joyful all the time. God will use suffering in his, his medical bag, as it were. His instruments that he uses to chafe, sh chamfer off the edges, to, to change us. Suffering and our, experience, our experiences. So he feels in a really difficult place. He feels forsaken. His prayers are not being answered. Uh, he, he's insignificant by his own people. They are turning against him. He's being maligned and criticised and persecuted. And there's those who seek him harm and bring down his downfall. And he's mentally scarred by it. It's affecting him bodily, physically, how he feels and where he is. He feels forsaken. But as Christians we must remember... This side of redemption, because of the cross of Christ, we will never be utterly forsaken. God would never forsake us. We are eternally saved because he was forsaken. Jesus was forsaken. And we were redeemed. But he may draw apart from us. And David probably feels so bad that God has forsaken him. But he could not go to the depths that Jesus went of that forsakenness that Jesus experienced. He could not go to those depths. God would not forsake him because we see that he comes through. This is a lament. Verses 1 to 21 is full of lament. But within those verses as well is a quiet confidence in the psalmist. Uh, Nietzsche, the humanist, said, a man can undergo torture if he knows the way of life. And Christian Rieger, who was a prisoner in a concentration camp, Christian, at Dachau, he said, I learned something far greater than the way of life. I learned to know the who of my life. He was enough to sustain me then and is enough to sustain me still. We often think about that, don't we? How would we cope in such and such a situation? Would we be able to cope in this situation? Think about Auschwitz, Dachau, these concentration camps where these individuals were, some of them Christians. And he's saying, I learnt the who of my life. Jesus was with him. Jesus understands about suffering. <laughs> for he suffered the Bible tells us in the book of Philippians that it's granted for us to believe on the Lord Jesus but also granted that we will suffer for the Lord Jesus we will suffer for the Lord Jesus and yeah there's many ways that we could suffer for the Lord Jesus we could suffer in a sense of uh, proclaiming his name for identifying him as Christians, but we, we can suffer in, in many ways for the Lord Jesus. The Christian and suffering. But first of all, here, look, an encouragement. If you're suffering and you feel forsaken of God, here's an encouragement. Look, verse 2. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Are you scratching your head at this point? An encouragement. He's not being answered. 
He can't even hear God. What's the encouragement there, Aubrey? That you're praying. That you're praying. Through it, you're praying. Don't you often feel like me? That when you pray, we've been praying for a musician, we've been praying for people. Where are they, God? You see, prayer is not necessary to... Uh, Prayer is not like a one-armed bandit where you put your penny in and you pull the slot and out comes the money sometimes. Prayer is not like that. Prayer, in essence, is something that God works in us and through us. Prayer changes us, changes our character, changes our uh, nature. The, the encouraging thing here is, is that he has not forsaken God. He is praying to God. He is seeking God. He is crying out to God day and night. This is a sign that he is a child of God. He's groaning. The words of my groaning. It talks about when we pray with the spirit prays and we groan with words that we can't, we can't utter, we can't express. You know, those silent prayers which are actually deep within. You see, because God hears our audible prayers when we went round. But there's, some people didn't pray. And that's okay. But God will hear the prayers of the heart within. Those words that we don't utter, that the Spirit groans and brings forward to God. It's an encouragement. And then we've got to understand why suffering. You know, that's a big one, isn't it, in the world? You know, if they don't understand God and the world, and why is there suffering? But we live in a fallen world. It's part and parcel of being in it. That we are going to suffer since Adam fell, all have sinned. And since the fall, sin came into the world and the wages of sin is death. And as a result, suffering. Humanity is suffering, the earth is suffering, everything. There is suffering all around. <laughs> That's better, isn't it? I could write a song. Love is all around. Suffering is all around. Wow, what a melancholic. Is it right, Jeremiah, this preacher, isn't he? But it's true. Suffering is a wonderful thing. The Puritans thought of suffering as, don't look at them as thieves who come to steal your joy, but friends who come to teach you perseverance. To persevere. To press on. Because if we've got a right understanding of why suffering in the world, we can put it in its rightful place, knowing we can embrace it. We say, well, this is part of the world. This is part of life. And you know, for a Christian, it is not a life of futility because even suffering is not wasted. It is something which is granted for us under the sovereignty of God. And at these times, we may well cry out and we must keep crying out to God in prayer day and night. And he will see our tears. He will hear our prayers. And he will be our rock and refuge. He will be our help. And he will come to our aid. I notice that ultimately in the end, which is the way of life in this psalm in verses from 22 onwards, talks about the way of life and how everybody from all the ends of the earth will, will come and worship him. But he could say it later on in, the, in this uh, psalm, Verse 24, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted and he has not hidden his face from him but has heard when he cried to him. Who was the afflicted? <laughs> David was the afflicted. Who'd heard when he cried to him? The Lord heard him. He knows ultimately the Lord hears him. The Lord saves him. He knows he's seeing forward to that path of life to the great congregation itself, where he will be. And so it is for us, brothers and sisters, we know where we're going. We know where we're heading. He has already heard our prayers in that direction because there was another one who cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he was forsaken so that we would never be forsaken. And so nothing is wasted and plus also it's part of our progressive sanctification that God uses this suffering in various 
ways. Romans 8, 18, uh, he doesn't think, consider our present sufferings anything to be compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. Or you can, write, you can read in James, the book of James, chapter 1. Let me just get to it. James chapter 1. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Count it joy. For you know that your testing of your faith, it's a real testing of your faith. When everything's going pear-shaped, when everything's difficult, that is the testing of your faith. Is it real? Are you pressing on? Are you going through? Because it produces steadfastness. And let steadfast have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God is using this suffering, these trials as a, a sanctifying work in our lives to make us more like Jesus. Somebody once, a bitter saint once said to their pastor, why has God made me this way? And gently he replied, God has not made you, he is making you. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 12 says, the Lord reproves those whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Martin Luther said, what doesn't destroy me makes me stronger. Christianity, he said, has always insisted that the cross we bear precedes the crown that we wear. The cross, that's the way of the Christian, the way of the cross, the way of suffering. It's the way that we are to go because that is what refines us and progressively sanctifies us when we seek to be obedient to what God requires from it. And plus also, suffering, it's a sign, isn't it, of the end times that we see in epidemic proportions in the West. We encounter it every day in our lives and with our neighbours as Christians. We're, we're encountering a God-forsakenness by the world, a great apostasy by the church, a falling away, just as Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24. He speaks of the signs of the close of an age. And he says in verse 9, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. False prophets arise and lead many astray. There is a world out there seeking us to conform to their pattern of living and life and belief. They are the ones who have forsaken God. They have forsaken God. And they are the ones that could well bring trouble our way. They do, subtly. Who wants to hear the message in the open air? <laughs> Who really wants to hear it? They've forsaken God. They, they do that which is right in their own eyes. And they have forsaken you. Jesus said, the world shall hate you and malign you, and persecute. That's what Jesus said, not me. Not, not, not. Jesus said that. The world will hate you. We're not here to be friends with the world. We're friends of Jesus. We're friends of, we're sinners who are saved by Jesus. We're his friends, but we're not friends of the world. We live in the world and not of the world. The world hates us. We want to be light, don't we? We all want to be light. But the reality is, if we are living for our Lord Jesus Christ, the world has forsaken us. We see it growing and growing and growing in society, in politics, in life, in our neighbourhoods. The dynamics are changing. As Jesus said in the latter days, there's a great sea change. And you know, there are prophets and teachers, those who profess to be Christians, who are identifying themselves, really, with the world. And they are forsaking Jesus. Just like Demas and Hymenus forsook God. 
for the love of money. And that is taking place as well. And so we, we, that's what will happen. There will be a great forsakenness. John 16, 33. Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. But here's the good news. Fear not, take heart. I have overcome the world. He has overcome it. Jesus is victorious. We can smile. We can see it. And we can put this in context. We can put our world and the responses we see in the world and not be despondent, but take heart. Because Jesus is on the throne, he has overcome. And we will never be forsaken because he was forsaken. But we, beware though. Beware because, you know, like David, we could be going through suffering and immense trials because of willful sin in our lives. Willful sin. There could be sin in our lives that God wants to bring out, to squeeze out like a zit, you know, I used to do that, a lot of that when I was a teenager, squeezing the zits, but, uh, and God wants to do that, he wants to do it in the life of David when he, when he committed adultery and, and he brought Nathan the prophet to him, and you know, there's a tendency that we can, that we can forsake God in, for our sin, that we can delight in that rather than God, but sin brings death. Sin brings pain and trial and heartache. And it's not what God wants what's best for us. God's got something far greater for us than our sin. He's got eternal life. He's got Christ. In such cases like David in Psalm 51, there's a real need. If it's sin in our lives that's causing us it's causing a blockage. It's causing us to be uh, unhappy in our lives. If we're not walking obediently with the Lord. And, and to some extent we all walk disobediently because it's in our, within our nature. But we have this new nature and this new nature has to increase. And the old nature has to decrease. It has to. It has to be killed. And throughout our lives on this journey, God will bring times and seasons in our lives when he highlights it and he says, look, look, look what this is doing to you. And now here, walk in this way through his word and show you the way to go in. And so God can use even our sin to show us and change us and conform us to that image of Christ if we seek to be obedient and repent and believe. And then ultimately here, it's Christ, isn't it? These words are like so poignant. We, can, we stand at the cross. It's as if these words are, are spoken from by Jesus and he, he's looking around on the crowd as he's lifted up, his hands pierced, his feet pierced, as he says here, on that cross, on that Gibbet of a cross with that cross beam across it. There he is, hanging naked. And he's seeing all that's going on. And it's right here. Verse 15. My strength is, dry, is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of the ground. He could say in John's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 28, he, he cried out, I thirst. Psalm 22, verse 16, for dogs encompass me. The Roman soldiers, the a company of evildoers, the, 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 the shepherds of Israel, actually a company of evildoers. The false shepherds, they encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. They crucified him, it tells us. And that crucifixion involved that piercing of hands and feet. All who see me mock me, verse 7. All who see me mock me and make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. They mocked him, didn't they? Matthew 28, 
27, 39. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they said. These words they said. They did. Verse 18, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. It's exactly what happened. And they crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Absolutely amazing. This is why this is the word of God. Because this was collectively put together even before Christ had been born. In the Torah and the law and the psalm in the Psalms. And Jesus told the people, you know, this is what you're to follow in the book of the Torah, in the in the law, in the prophets and the Psalms. All that is written about me is in these books. And here it is, verbatim. As if it actually happened. Could you imagine somebody writing about your life? Thousands of years before, a thousand years before, and telling you that you're going to work at Emmanuel Christian School, that you're going to get a first class honours in your history lectures or whatever it is. Could you imagine somebody writing all that? Oh, here it is, Esther, it says it. I wonder if they're like that. Will it happen? Could you imagine? Well, this is what took place. This is written all those years ago because it is God's word. He brought it into being and he suffered more than any of us could possibly ever imagine and could possibly suffer. That was the most excruciating way to possibly physically die and probably still is to this day. Hanging upon a, on a cross, dying of a suffixation, suffering that way. And yet, more than it all, these opening words of this psalm are just like a, a banner. They're a big question for us to answer. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus wasn't just thinking, oh, I've got to utter that word. I've got to say that word just to fulfill the prophecy. Or all the other things, I've got to see all those things happening. It wasn't like that at all. It wasn't on his to-do list of fulfilment of prophecy checklist. No, this was his real felt experience that Jesus was forsaken from his father. He was forsaken in that relationship that he had before the foundation of the earth. In that divine economy of the Godhead, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, in that relationship. And when he even became human and dwelt amongst us, it tells us that he had a close relationship with his Father, even then in his humanity. That we said in our prayer breakfast that he drew aside to a solitary place. Why? Because he had communion with his Father. But here upon this cross, he had no communion with the Father. He had the belt. He had the belt of the Father. The right and just belt. I always just remember that, my uncle used to get his belt off. But this is a belt of, of love. Because this is a just and right thing that the Father is doing. He is punishing his son in our place. He bears our sins in his body. He becomes a curse. He becomes an anathema. The wrath, the holy indignation, the cup of God's fury, all of it. Tyson Fury actually won the boxing fight, didn't he? It was a bit of a, a non-fight, really. I didn't watch it or anything. But, but here on the cross is the fury of God. And on sin, it was poured out upon Jesus. And that communion that Jesus had at that point as he was made sin and the holy God turned his face away from him, he could not look upon sin whom he had become upon that cross, our Lord Jesus Christ. And he was forsaken. 
He was despised and rejected by men. That is true. Isaiah 53 verse 3 tells us that. But he was despised at that moment. He was rejected by God on that cross. He was a man of sorrows and he was acquainted with grief. He was sympathises with our human fallenness. Although he was without sin, he sympathises with our weakness. He was tempted to every extreme but fell not into temptation. And yet on that cross, where Jesus bore our sin, absorbed the wrath of God and became a propitiation for our sins, we cannot begin to fathom what that means. We're not acquainted with it, what he suffered on that cross. But we do know it was for us. That he loves us to such an extent that God the Son would be obedient to God the Father and would be willing to be forsaken upon that cross to redeem a people unto himself. A people that had rejected him. And we're no better, for we rejected him too. He came to his own, but his own received him not. But to all those who receive him, he gives them the right to become children of God. The Jewish brothers, they became his enemies. At their hands he suffered hostility. And they would crucify him. Peter is true that he places the blame, doesn't he, directly at the feet of the uh, Jewish people. In Acts chapter 2, we see that. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23 and verse 36. Let me just read those two verses. In verse 23 it says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified. Where is it? You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. But we see that there as well, don't we? In verse 23. It wasn't just the humans. It wasn't just his, those who had rejected him. But this was the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. God had ordained this and set it into motion. And delivered it. In order... That we might not be forsaken. That his holiness, his divine justice might be satisfied. And his love be truly demonstrated to a broken world, to a suffering world. Where our God suffered himself, identified with us and plunged the depths of sin that we cannot begin to enter into as he was made sin upon that cross. Yes, we collectively, as human beings, forsook him. Yes, it was we. We pierced him. We mocked him. We ripped off his garments. We divided them. We derided them. We wagged our heads. We openly scoffed at him. We are no different, for we have all sinned. And yet more profoundly, God laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53 verse 6. And this is why he 
He's crying out at this point, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A great transaction has taken place. He has become sin and we have become the righteousness of God. I always say it's like that transaction that took place. I forgot who it is now. Ah, that was it. Joseph and his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Is it Ephraim, the other son? Ephraim. Forgive my pronunciation, Steve. Manasseh and Ephraim, his father, when he blessed them, he crossed over his arms. And our God in heaven, our Lord Jesus, our Father crosses over his arms and the blessing falls upon us and the curse falls upon our Lord Jesus that we might never be forsaken, that we might be God's children. And so Jesus experienced that forsakenness and that great transaction took place. He bled and died in our place, but he's now risen and exalted and seated. Yes, he was forsaken for a time, but he was laid in that tomb for three days. And on the third day, the Lord was raised from the tomb. He was risen and now he's exalted and seated and he's reigning and it has all been accomplished. But he was forsaken so that we will never be forsaken. And there is coming a day when there is no more suffering. We'll be refined. We'll be like him. He'll wipe away our tears from all our eyes. There will no longer be any death, neither sorrow nor crying. There shall be no more pain. The former things are passed away and all things are made new. So, amen, may God bless his word. We'll leave it, leave it there and maybe next week I can just, uh, I've got a bit to go and it's 12 o'clock. So. But uh, there is a shared confidence in there as well. If you want to think about that, we'll probably look at that next week. His shared confidence, where he draws his confidence from. Uh, we can see it in verses uh, 3 to 5 and uh, in other places too. Uh, verses 9 to 11 and verses 19 to 21. Uh, David, in the midst of his trial, he has confidence. And this is where we can draw our confidence as well. Whilst we are living in this life, um, in the midst of trials and sufferings. We don't have to be morose. We can be overcomers and have confidence in God that he will deliver us. Amen. So we're going to sing our closing hymn, 809. Oh, I chose this one because, you know, we all know, and I didn't mention this quote, but Horatio Spafford. We all know about Horatio Spafford, don't we? And uh, how his life was, uh, he knew immense trouble. He had a son who died of scarlet fever at a young age, he and his wife, Anna. Uh, he had a business, a property business in Chicago, which was uh, more or less burnt to the ground under the great fire of Chicago. He was going over to a D.L. Moody conference in Wales, and he was taking his family, his wife and his four children, and he had to stay behind for some business, but uh, he sent his wife ahead with his four daughters. And halfway through the journey, their ship collided with another ship and all life was lost except for his wife was saved, and, but all his daughters were lost at sea. And um, when he came over, the, the ship's captain stopped the ship over the area where the accident happened. And it was here that he penned these words to this song, uh, that it is well with my soul.